I'm always amazed by how few people consider anesthesia central to the problem of, of consciousness, okay? Um, considering the miraculous <laughs> efficiency of it. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. This episode continues my series on consciousness. Are we biological robots? Today, I'm getting into some real science, talking to a biophysicist who brings the esoteric world of quantum mechanics to bear on the topic. His groundbreaking work in the lab provides us with some real measurements that provide tantalizing hints at the previously unknown quantum processes tied to consciousness. If you like what you're hearing, please press like on your podcast app and share it with your friends. Love to hear from you. Uh, come check out my website at www.therationalview.ca. Luca Turin was born in 1953 in Beirut, Lebanon, to Italian Argentinian parents. He was brought up in France, Italy, and Switzerland, studied physiology and biophysics at University College London, uh, received his PhD in 1978. He worked at the CNRS and then was a lecturer at biophysics at UCL. He's best known for his work on olfaction, the sense of smell, in which he proposed a quantum mechanism for odorant recognition by our receptors. For eight years, he was CTO of a venture company designing odorants for fragrance and flavors with a success rate 100 times the industry average. After returning to full-time research in 2009, in collaboration with Makis Skoulakis in Athens, Greece, he has shown that both flies and humans can detect molecular vibrations by smell. His current interest is in quantum electronics and neuroscience. He's the author of three perfume guides, a collection of essays, and a popular science book on how smell works. He is currently a professor in the medical school at the University of Buckingham. Dr. Turin, welcome to The Rational View. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Delighted to be invited. It's a pleasure to be here. So you're famous for your theory linking molecular vibrations to our sense of smell. The scientific consensus, I think, had been that our sense of smell was governed by molecular shapes binding to sensor proteins. Much of our biochemistry in our bodies is governed by this type of well-understood binding interaction between a protein sensor coded by our DNA and substances from the environment. How did you realize and show that smell is, is different, that we're actually detecting vibrations? Well, uh, first of all, um, um, when I started looking into it, which was in the early 90s, I, I became gradually aware of the fact that um, there were a number of things that didn't really make sense in the standard explanation. And the, the chief one, uh, the most striking one, was that very small molecules have uh, very distinctive smells. Uh, and similarly, functional groups, meaning arrangements of a couple or three atoms that are chemically reactive that are attached to a molecule, can be smelt independently of the rest of the molecule. So these two things, tiny molecules and functional groups, um, are kind of difficult to explain with the shape theory because um, if you have a very small molecule or a feature of a larger molecule, uh, it will make at most, let's say, one, uh, let's say, hydrogen bond, um, one bond with the receptor to which it's going to attach. How does the receptor know which atoms are actually making that hydrogen bond? It's very hard to imagine uh, how a receptor would know, for example, infallibly, um, at any concentration, always, uh, that you're dealing with an OH rather than an SH, let's say, or um, an NH rather than an OH. Those are very different smells, okay? Uh, but they're only capable of making one hydrogen bond. And so the striking feature uh, of olfaction was that it seemed to be reading the atoms 
in a different way than the standard fashion envisaged by, by shape. Now, a physicist friend of mine, when I told him about this, said, oh, that's easy. Look, the atoms are different colors, right? So, <laughs> um, you, show a you show a molecular model, of course, uh, owing to a series of decisions, mostly by Linus Pauling in the late 50s, um, oxygen is red, sulfur is yellow, um, carbon is black, and hydrogen is white. So, yes. Um, and of course, <laughs> it would be absolutely wonderful if somehow um, the sense of smell could um, detect, so to speak, the molecular colors. And in fact, it's kind of what it does, because what um, um, until uh, magnetic resonance came along, the way that molecules were identified by chemists was by infrared spectroscopy. Yes. If you were given, give someone an unknown, they would put it in a infrared spectrometer and look at the vibrational spectrum. And from that, you can infer a fair few things. You can't, typically, you can't exactly identify the molecule, but you can tell that it has a particular functional group. Or it's, in other words, you can, you're doing really what the, what the sense of smell is doing. So this was the background, but actually the most important part of the background was that people had proposed uh, vibrations as the explanation for smell all the way back to the 1930s. Okay. Um, I was by no means the first person to do so. There were uh, you know, half a dozen very distinguished uh, um, chemists and biophysicists who had done so. The biggest problem for that theory, which was intrinsically rather uh, attractive for reasons I can explain, the problem was that there was no mechanism to detect vibrations. If you, you know, if, right. if you look up somebody's nose, you don't see lasers and prisms. We okay? don't have infrared spectrometers in our nose. Exactly. You don't, you don't see much in the way of optics, um, least of all infrared optics, which are, of course, strongly absorbed by water and, you know, which the body's made of. So um, this theory had <clears throat> gradually sort of um, died a death over the years from the 60s onwards. It was basically downhill um, because no mechanism was proposed. I suddenly realized that there was a very straightforward mechanism called electron tunneling spectroscopy, which could be adapted to biology. Ele electron tunneling spectroscopy is a mechanism that requires electrons to travel over short distances across a molecule and be scattered by its vibrations. When I realized that this type of spectroscopy existed, because I'd never heard of it, um, I, was, I just came upon it largely by chance, um, I realized that it was perfect um, um, for biology because the mechanism itself acts on very uh, small distances. It's a tunneling mechanism, so 10 angstroms is a long way for a tunneling mechanism, but that's about right for biology, 10 or less. And, um, and so I started trying to correlate the vibrational spectra with, with smell in different ways. And, in 96, I produced a, an article uh, after about a year and a half to two years of work. I produced an article which was published in Chemical Senses uh, explaining what the, the theory was about and how it could explain various things um, to do with various features of olfaction. This thing um, didn't make much of a, a dent in the, in, the, in, in, in the science world. It, it was featured in a, in a science documentary by the BBC, so it, it, okay. it got people out there interested, but it made, it made no particular um, splash in, uh, in the olfaction community. Um, and uh, until, really, uh, several years later, when some physicists, colleagues of mine at University College London, um, decided to look into it a bit more deeply. I'm not a proper physicist. I'm a bi biologist who's learned enough physics to, to, to survive. Um, and they, when they, uh, Marshall Stoneham, who was the, the, um, the, the senior author on the, on, on, on the work, on the physics work, he, he came to the conclusion, he, he initially thought I must be completely delusional. <laughs> and therefore tried to go in there and disprove it, and then found to his horror that not only could he not disprove it, it actually worked quite nicely, thank you very much. <laughs> and so they published an article, <laughs> you know, which was really great good luck because um, my, my uh, proposal until then had been largely hand-waving. Um, That's how science works, right? We, we try to disprove a theory, yeah, exactly. and if we can't, then we 
we give it provisional acceptance <laughs> until we ex- get our next experiment. Exactly. Marshall Stoneham and Andrew Horsfield felt that this thing had legs, you know, and from then on, it, it really sort of took off. From a theory standpoint, um, the physicists find it very easy to understand the whole thing. From an experimental standpoint, I think we've shown pretty conclusively that, that both uh, fruit flies um, and humans can, can smell um, isotopes. There's been a lot of uh, back and forth and controversy in the olfaction community, and the jury really is still out. Um, there's no definitive experiment. If you, what I mean by definitive experiment is if you propose that electrons are involved in a receptive mechanism, you have to catch the electrons. Okay, you have to somehow mm. um, show that this is happening directly. Okay, it, it's it's non-trivial to do that. So, in terms of phenomenology, I think we've, you know, we've pretty much shown that the most rational, the most economical explanation for the whole thing is vibrations. But in terms of actual hardcore biophysical mechanism, there is no um, definite proof yet. I see. Yeah, and and it's not obvious to to someone how a protein could be doing this electron spectroscopy i mean it's it's you know a difficult mechanism to make as a in the lab how does a protein make these me- these measurements like i mean if if scientists had access to a a molecule that could do this measurement i think it would be useful <laughs> um yeah that part is not so so diff- i mean um w- when you're a <coughs> biophysicist you know, if you consider the range of absolutely insane things that, that life has actually figured out, <coughs> excuse me, that work, you know, re- reliably, <laughs> uh, in, on a scale of one to ten of complexity and weirdness, this is about a three for biology. Okay, okay. okay. That, that's really interesting. So I would say, you know, you're one of a, sl- a select group who's been able to successfully question a scientific consensus with relatively convincing experimental data. Uh, so moving on from, from sense of smell, you've now dipped your toes into what I would say the sometimes contentious field of consciousness studies um, uh, with so, some of the papers that uh, we've discussed before this. Uh, is this a natural progression from your work on the sense of smell bringing into uh, the field of cognition? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, you know, I studied neurophysiology as an undergraduate. And, okay. and if you do that, um, unless, you're, um, unless you've drunk a lot of the Kool-Aid, um, you will, it will become obvious that our knowledge of what's going on in the brain, while impressive, is, I would say, inadequate to the magnitude of the task. <laughs> okay. Indeed. So, yeah. And so I've always been interested. I've always been interested in um, consciousness simply because everyone is. Okay, I mean, and if you're a neuroscientist, it's pretty clear that you know there, there are you know at least two gigantic problems um, in biology in general unsolved. One is the origin of life, and the, the other one is the nature of consciousness. So this doesn't mean that you're going to work on either the origin of life or the nature of consciousness because part of the reason why they're unsolved is because they're devilishly hard and it you know it may not be a great place to pitch your tent and start working. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so anytime, anytime you figure something out, a new mechanism, you say, well, how does this play in neuroscience, let's say? How, how does it modify our vision of how the brain works? Because sense of smell is tied to... The- you know, our senses and the senses are part of our consciousness. It's part of what philosophers call the hard problem of consciousness is how do we feel things and sense things? It's quaily, right? Yeah, but also, I mean, if you look at it from a hardware standpoint, if you have receptors uh, in, the, in the nose that sense, that use an electronic mechanism, it becomes natural to ask, well, are those receptors also elsewhere? possibly detecting things that have nothing to do with olfaction, but is this electronic part a feature of other receptors? Um, sure. <laughs> if so, how does that interface with the rest of what we know about neurons and so on? So it, it's, it's more of an, it's a natural, 
from a standpoint of hardware rather than software, I mean, by, by software, I mean, by, by hardware, I mean the actual nuts and bolts of which cells are made, okay? Mm -hmm. If you find a new, a new nut or a new bolt, you, you ask, well, where else is it, okay? So that's a perfectly normal biological approach. Okay, so moving on to your, your work in this field, you've taken, undertaken some really cool experiments with fruit flies that show something, I think, completely unexpected. Could you walk us through your hypothesis? So um, fruit flies, first of all, let me just make a little advertisement for fruit flies. It, you know, they, they are the absolute um, best place to, um, to study anything. If, if you're interested, for example, in neuroscience, uh, fruit flies are fantastic because you have essentially complete genetic control. Mm -hmm. um, you can turn on and off at will any one of the 14 or so thousand genes of a, of a fly. Wow. Uh, they're cheap. They work, um, uh, the generation time is short. You know, they're, they're just a wonderful experimental animal, but also they're not stupid. So that if you have a curve, you know, uh, you know, you have really dumb animals like C. elegans, you know, the nematode at the bottom, and you have, let's say, mice or whatever, humans at the, at the top. Flies are pretty good midway point because you can, they learn, you know, you can teach them wow. uh, to respond to stimuli and choose one part of a maze over another, that kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a, you know, a lot of behavior that you can affect with fruit flies and the genetics. And I don't think, and it's cheap. So that, because if you go and mess with mice, it's months and lots of money. With flies, it's weeks and not much money. So that's the, the advertisement for fruit flies. So the point was, we were interested in anesthesia because anesthesia is, um, the existence of general anesthetics, um, which were discovered in the 1840s um, in the U.S. first and then in the U.K., is the most extraordinary fact in all of medicine. Okay? I mean, we've got used to it. It's a little bit like, you know, oh, you know, it's going to have a general you know, and have his appendix there. But hold on a minute. You know, as I always say, it seems like the only thing that we know about consciousness reliably really is that it's soluble in chloroform. Yes, I've heard that quote. I love that quote. Okay. okay. So this is, this is an astounding fact. And it's not only has it absolutely revolutionized medicine, but surely if you want to know how consciousness works, the fact that you can remove it and practically nothing else, because the most important thing about anesthesia is not just that it removes consciousness, but that it leaves the rest unaffected. Mm. In other words... Your heart's still working. Your guts are still working. You're, you're, if you stimulate the muscles, they, they'll still contract. They, you know, everything's working except you're out, cold. Now, to me, this fact uh, never ceases to amaze me, okay? As it must have. It's magic. <laughs> it's, it's essentially magic. And most people don't realize that we have no idea how they work. So this is just something that we've stumbled on that these yeah, things do. Yeah, I mean, it was stumbled on it... with ether in the U.S. and with chloroform in the U.K. And gradually, you know, it wasn't a sudden realization. It was kind of futzing around. Um, people realized that they could use this, and then it became, you know, uh, uh, it became mandatory for surgery, right? Until then, it was morphine and then bite the bullet, you know, and, um, and then it became, and ether, you know, was a very safe anesthetic. You could still use it today. Very simple. You know, you just put some gauze on the person's face and you drop it ether with a drop or a certain number of drops per minute. And what I'm saying is in the field, if you or I, God forbid, were asked to up to remove the appendix, assuming we knew where it was and we could find it, of a person in the field, you would all you would need is some gauze, a bottle of ether, and a dropper, wow. and you could do it. Not okay. me. <laughs> so, why 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 fruit flies? Well, the fact is, fruit flies. There are mutants, mutant strains of fruit flies that are resistant to anesthetics. Okay. And so, and so, if you're going to study something, if you say, okay, well, I, you know, I'll bet you it's whatever that governs anesthesia. Well, you go and measure that whatever in the flies that are normal and in the flies that are resistant to anesthetics and see if there's a difference. So we uh, were measuring uh, spin, uh, electron spin in flies, which is a pretty um, straightforward thing. You put live flies in a, in a 
spin resonance uh, spectrometer, which is a machine with magnets and microwaves. Um, and we found that um, there was a, uh, that the spin changes uh, during um, general anesthesia. There's a small uh, increase in, uh, in electron spin. The spin of an electron is, is basically the magnetic moment of the electron. You can measure it with magnetic uh, sensors. That's right. And so when you measure, what you, when you measure electron spin, what all you're really doing is measuring the amount of electrons that are floating around, okay? The number of electrons. And we found that this number increases in normal flies, but fails to increase in the mutant uh, flies. Under okay? anesthesia. Under anesthesia. So the flies that are resistant to anesthetics show no spin change. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, now, this is interesting. I mean, in itself, there's not much you can do with this fact, but it's not in isolation. The, 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 there's a whole um, subfield, if you want, of neuroscience, which has to do with uh, respiration inside cells. You know, as, we, as, you, as you know, cells um, use oxygen uh, as a terminal electron acceptor to make uh, energy for the, for, the, for, the, for the cell, to make ATP. And this happens in former bacteria that have been co-opted into, into our cells called mitochondria. And the connection between mitochondria and anesthesia is getting stronger and stronger by the day. Interesting. And the reason this is important, uh, to the, by which I mean uh, simple things like people who have mitochondrial diseases typically behave very strangely under anesthesia, somewhat dangerously. Okay. Okay. So there's a whole subfield of anesthesiology that deals with mitochondrial disease as a complicating factor in anesthesia. Um, also, we now know that mitochondria are present in every synapse. There's a mitochondria sitting there doing its thing. Okay. okay. So you can, the reason why this matters to the spin is that almost all the electrons in a cell are in the mitochondria. Okay. Because the mitochondria, I mean, what, what respiration is, is an electrochemical mechanism that takes electrons and gives them to oxygen. Okay. And, and aside from that, produces energy. But the basic electrical circuit is electrons entering this complicated chain of things and going to oxygen. And that wire is full of electrons. Okay? Wow. And, and so spin measurements tell you what's indirectly, really, what's going on in there. And so that's, that's partly why we got interested in all this. Um, and so I cannot tell you right now what these electrons are doing. You know, with that, this is the, the big question. Why, I mean, what are mitochondria doing in consciousness? Um, you know, I mean, let, let me give you another example. If you cut off the blood supply to the brain by inflating a cuff around the neck, mm -hmm. not a particularly pleasant or a safe thing to do, but it's been done. If you cut off the blood supply, you lose consciousness in seven seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a very peculiar number, seven seconds, because it's not, you know, as everybody knows, you can be, your brain starts actually being starved of oxygen after two or three minutes of anoxia. You know, if somebody, um, it, that, that's when you start having a real problem. But seven seconds is awfully short. It's as if the electron current uh, going through mitochondria is necessary to us being conscious because that will stop very rapidly. Hmm. Okay. So these are all disconnected factoids that I'm giving you, but that's the reason why we're digging in that particular corner. Now this, is, this is great because... <clears throat> Consciousness studies is such a broad, diverse field. Uh, you've got philosophers, you've got uh, theologists, you've got physicists, you've got biologists. Everyone's got an opinion on it, but no one's got data. And that's in 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 this podcast. I'm trying to find you know the evidence based uh, work that's going on, and this really starts to ground you because this is this is real experimental hints as to what's going on. And I think this is great. Um, so, so you've discovered a spin difference in these fruit flies, electron spin difference, and you're tying it to, to mitochondria. What 
um, what's the significance of this? Do you, can you, how would you explain the, the significance of this to the general public, or do you even know? No, I, I would explain it gladly if I knew. Um, um, I don't know. I will say this, though, that um, we're working on it, and some later work that we've done suggests there might be something going on, okay? I assume we're going to get to that in a minute. But I just want to say, uh, in passing, that I'm always amazed by how few people consider anesthesia central to the problem of, of consciousness, okay? Um, considering the miraculous <laughs> efficiency of it. Okay? Indeed. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I think one should really give credit to, there's one person who's done uh, a tremendous amount to keep, the, to keep the interest going, to focus people on, on anesthesia, and that's Stuart Hameroff. Yes, okay. Uh, Stuart Hameroff is an anesthesiologist uh, from, from Arizona originally, who, uh, <clears throat> who, who's always really uh, militantly argued for the fact that if we understood anesthesia, we'd understand consciousness, okay? Now, I don't necessarily agree with the, the mechanisms that he proposes. I don't think, for example, that microtubules are the key to, to, to all of it, but nevertheless, his relentless uh, focus on anesthesia as the key is, in my opinion, the exact right approach to dealing with consciousness as a scientific problem. Yeah, no, no. Hameroff and uh, Sir Roger Penrose together have a, a theory of um, consciousness as some sort of a quantum mechanical mind process, which happens in these uh, peculiar organelles called microtubules. So it's not uh, a, they don't believe, or Penrose basically put together a series of books which, which suggested that he does not believe that uh, a Turing machine, a computer, effectively can be conscious. He doesn't believe that classical computing can result in consciousness. He's got several arguments based on Godel's incompleteness theories and, and various things that he says. And it's very controversial, but it's an interesting thought. He thinks we need the the magic of quantum mechanics. Uh, and, and, you know, he's proposing um, changes or because quantum mechanics is, is effectively an incomplete theory. We don't understand it as physicists how the so-called collapse of the wave function occurs. We have this, the Schrodinger's cat thing. And, and at some point you go from a superposition to a uh, one state or another, there's all sorts of different interpretations about how this progresses, whether it's multiple worlds and, and each the cat's alive in one world and it's dead in the other world, or maybe the wave function collapses on a single thing. And there's only one timeline. So this is looking at timelines and all sorts of things. And, and a lot of people just mumble quantum mechanics and try to use that to solve the hard problem of consciousness. And I don't know if it does that, but that's that's what Penrose and, and Hameroff, I think, are are proposing in some in some in their esoteric way. Um, but there's a lot of other ideas about how quantum mechanics might affect this. And I think these experiments that you're doing are, are maybe pointing the direction to some sort of quantum mechanical processes being involved in in consciousness. The, these these spin uh, alignments, uh, you know, are similar to what people do in, in quantum computers. People build qubits, which, you know, in a regular computer, you have bits that are one or zero. Well, in a quantum computer, you have bits that are zero, one, or a superposition of zero and one. And every, uh, you have a state of a whole bunch of coherent qubits, which are all overlapping in this huge Schrodinger's cat type system. And effectively a quantum computer can process everything at once. It can, it, it has this, this way it can, can leapfrog over classical computers and can do a heck of a lot more processing with uh, the same number of bits, like orders of magnitude, more uh, processing effectively. So this is something that a lot of people wonder if biology could be doing. And does your work point in that direction, would you say? Well, there are two things here. First of all, um, um, explaining one mystery by another sometimes is productive, sometimes isn't. It's hard to predict which, one, which way this will go. So, I mean, what, by which I mean, you know, the, the notion that we don't understand consciousness. Hey, we don't understand the, the foundations of quantum mechanics. <laughs> Therefore, they're going to make great music together. That is, um, that's a bet. That's a hunch. It's not really a fact. 
Secondly, the quantum computing aspect, I mean, again, you know, yes, uh, quantum computers um, have now demonstrated supremacy in a particular, well, apparently you're not supposed to use the word supremacy, it's funny, okay. quantum advantage, it's called now, I think, um, um, in a particular class of problems. Uh, I actually visited the Google Quantum uh, AI labs in, uh, in uh, Santa Barbara uh, a few weeks ago. Those machines are just jaw-dropping pieces of engineering. But I will say this, um, when you look at the precautions that these people have to take to make sure the, the quantum, the qubits survive a few milliseconds or depending on microseconds, um, it doesn't make you very hopeful about a room temperature <laughs> quantum computer. Okay? Right. Um, it, it's actually a very sobering experience because people, you know, people who got interested in the quantum aspects of neuroscience, they say, oh, maybe the brain's a quantum computer. But, and if you say that to a bunch of people who've just spent like 10 years um, stabilizing qubits against the most microscopic interference, magnetic, electrical, temperate, thermal, anything, they look at you and they say, yeah, you know, sure. <laughs> Good luck. There, I mean, there may be ways of getting around it but we're a million miles away from proving them experimentally. And more broadly, I would say, I've just been to, in fact, the reason I was in Santa Barbara was a quantum brain meeting. Oh, cool. Uh, organized by both Google and the Allen Institute um, in um, Seattle. Uh, Allen Institute of Neuroscience. Interesting. And it was, it was very interesting, and, and I'm really glad to see that a lot of really smart people are moving into this field. Um, because that's a prerequisite to making progress. Mm. This said, uh, there's, there is a theory heavy in fact light, that whole thing. Indeed, I, I agree. Uh, and and unless, until and unless that, that, that changes, we actually get um, proper data. Um, um, I, think, I think it's, you know, it, it can sustain interest for a few more years, but we need... We need actual, you know, experimental data. And just, just to expand on what you said about the difficulty of, of building a quantum computer, uh, you know, quantum systems to do their processing need to be isolated from their environments. Uh, the Schrodinger's cat, the cat in the box, loses its mystical superposition if you jostle the box. You will find out if the cat is alive or dead. <laughs> you need to have that isolated from thermal and magnetic in any way to inquire into the box. Any information coming out of that box makes the whole thing fall apart. And this is called decoherence. And the same thing, of course, would happen in our brains and our body all the time because we're warm. And these computers, they cool them down to close to absolute zero to keep these things from getting jostled. The magic leaks out very quick in a human body temperature. Um, so yeah, how would it be possible to have quantum superpositions in a hot body is, is probably the, the root question of, of, of these people that are, that are working on it, is that? Yeah, yeah, and in fact, uh, um, w w as I said, you know, some seriously smart people have moved into that field, and one of them um, is uh, Matthew Fisher from Santa Barbara, as it happens. Okay. Who has proposed that nuclear spins, not electron spins, um, can store qubits in a stable fashion, in a particular type of um, calcium phosphate arrangement. Okay. Um, and his, his, the logic of his argument is absolutely superb, and, and he is a demigod in condensed matter physics. <laughs> so he, unlike many of us biologists who, or biophysicists who know just enough physics to stay afloat, Matthew uh, actually knows his stuff. Um, and I think his model, um, I put it this way, um, a friend of mine once said, there are three types of ideas. There's the uh, boring if true, there's the interesting if true, and then at the very top there's the interesting even if not true. And I think Matthew Fisher's um, uh, proposal that the qubits are stored in calcium phosphate and mitochondria, because that's what he's proposing. Uh, is, um, first of all, can be disproved. So it's, you know, this is great. And secondly, is utterly brilliant as, a, as an invention. And I'm sure will inform other approaches 
even if it's wrong, um, will inform, will stay in the mind of people. Yeah, uh, I've I've stumbled across his work and I, I've you know read his um, introduction to this. So he he's identified biochemical systems in our bodies that have unique properties that could be st stable isolated quantum qubits. Now, nuclear spin is is more stable than electron spin. Nuclei uh, is where all the mass is in our in our atoms and our molecules. The the nuclei are heavy and harder to perturb, and can be isolated from uh, if they have certain particular properties. Can be isolated uh, from from thermal effects, uh, and this is what what he's proposing that these qubits are 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 molecules, small molecules that that exist in these mitochondria, and this links some sort of spin processing quantum computer to the biochemical firing of neurons. Yeah, so which is really amazing. I mean this is this is this is a whole field of study that's just suddenly appeared, I think. Yes, it, it has. And I think and I think the wonderful thing is that um, um, you know physicists um, are willing to learn enough biology to make a difference. Um, see I've never really believed in interdisciplinarity as in you put a biologist and a physicist together in the same room and you hope that they have babies, so to speak. Um, <laughs> it doesn't quite work that way. Um, for, for, for ideas to really become um, fruitful, the knowledge has to be inside one particular skull. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to know all of biology and all of physics. In fact, since nobody knows anyway, all of either. Um, but you have to know enough to know who to ask and that kind of thing. It's more of an enabling uh, amount of knowledge. Um, and, I, and I think that, that that's what's happening now. A lot of very bright physicists uh, have just figured out that biology is, you know, the result of a four billion year research and development program of evolution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that we are essentially, biologists are reverse engineers. Okay, that's what we are. We, we've got this magnificent thing and we're hitting it with a hammer to see what happens, okay? And there's a tremendous amount of physics in there that we probably are not aware of right now. Mm. Uh, I don't mean that it'll break the laws of known physics. I'm saying it's going to use them in completely novel ways. Indeed, I had a, an earlier interview with a, with a philosopher, uh, Dr. Arthur Reber, uh, and he has put forward the postulate that uh, consciousness has a cellular basis. It begins at the cells, and even you know individual cells have some level of sentience. And that his theory, uh, he's exploring maybe this is something to do with the um, lipid membrane, the the cell walls, because of ion channels. And you know, anesthetic seems to have something that's soluble in lipids going on with it. Um, but he doesn't have the physics to 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 go this next step but i think what you are what what you and and maybe matthew are uh proposing is consistent with cellular level consciousness does that seem reasonable yes no, I, absolutely I, I, I mean the the great um cell intelligence um researcher was uh, is uh, Gunther Albrecht Bühler who was worked in the US and he's been arguing that cells are quite smart, individual cells are quite smart for a long time. I will say this concerning neurons. If you look at what a neuron is supposed to be doing electrically with all these inputs, synapses, and one output, it's supposed to be an adder, an integrator of sorts, okay? You add up all the pluses and minuses, you put a little delay, and then you decide whether to fire. I find it really unlikely that all of cellular evolution gave us an integrate and fire, okay? I think if you consider the neuron, I mean the neuron, think of the neuron in the brain, it is the aristocracy of cells, right? It's sitting there surrounded by glia, mollycoddled, massaged, just like the Wagyu beef, okay? It <laughs> drinks beer and, and chews, you know, grass and is fed by all these glial cells. This damn thing is precious. You can't make any more. You, you, they only die during your lifetime. You don't really renew the neuron. The, the notion that 
all of evolution gave you the neuron, and then the neuron is just something that adds up all the synaptic inputs and fires an action potential, I'm sorry. A jellyfish can do that. Hmm. Um, I don't really believe that's the story. I think there's something going on inside neurons that we know nothing about. Um, some computing going on, probably a higher speed than the action potentials and all that stuff, um, that we know nothing about, which will turn out to be central to the, to, to, to the problem of consciousness. So one of the problems that neuroscience has is basically right now, in my opinion, is they're trying to make a functioning brain from available elements, you know, from what we know about neurons. Now, it may be doable. I don't know. Uh, neural networks certainly, you know, show some pretty... They work. They work. Right? So it could be doable. But suppose, in fact, that there is another layer of hardware underneath the one that we are familiar with, uh, a device layer within neurons, then of course that's going to completely affect how you think about how the brain is organized. And that's what Matthew Fisher and... Uh, but let me emphasize this. Right now, it's a hunch. It's not a, it's not a fact. Science works on hunches. Um, it, after, it, you know, if after 30 years the hunch hasn't panned out, you may wish to move on to another one, but that's where we are right now. But it's, it's such a, a fertile field right now. I mean, I don't think anyone else has been looking at, you know, coherent spins in biological systems. Like this is really a, a completely new area of research. And your experiments with fruit flies, you're, you're measuring uh, RF emissions, I think, from... That's right. That's a it's a different avenue of research, and it's a very interesting one. Um, and it, it follows from what I consider to be the most important uh, discovery in biophysics the last 20 years, which is the discovery that um, uh, by, by um, an Israeli scientist called Ron Naaman. He's a very distinguished chemist at the Weizmann Institute. He's just retiring, I believe, uh, although he's super active. Um, and about, uh, when was that, 20, 25 years ago, he discovered that electron spins, when they travel through a medium that has, that's helical, that, that has, that is chiral, that has handedness, okay, become spin polarized, okay? Um, this is a very unexpected, because if you think about it, the amount of magnetic field you need to polarize a spin is very high. Uh, sure, um, yeah, yeah. Because the energies involved are fairly, uh, fairly small. So, the Discovery that actually all of biological electronics is beginning to look like spintronics. So in other words, electron currents in biology are not just current, they're currents of spin. Okay? Wow. This, you know, and a similar thing is happening in, in condensed matter uh, physics. I mean, they're, they're moving on to spintronic circuits and all that. And there's a whole new, you know, weird physics going on there, which could be as I say, the, you know, biology may be discovered that a couple of billion years ago and never told us about it until now. The reason I, I mean, I think on Naaman's stuff is absolutely Nobel Prize level. Um, and so do lots of people. Um, my interest in it was actually slightly from a different angle was if you have a population of spins, which is polarized, it's by definition out of thermal equilibrium. Right, and that thermal equilibrium is because things bounce around and eventually they're just randomly oriented, but you need something special to align them. That's right. So imagine, imagine you have a spintronic current highly polarized. The moment it exits, whatever is doing the polarizing, namely the protein, I suppose, you know, the helical field, is going to relax to equilibrium. And in doing so, it could emit either, it could generate either heat or radio waves. OK, so my attitude was, OK, let's go. Let's go see if we can see radio waves coming out of fly brain when they're active. And we found them. Uh, we found RF emissions, you know, radio frequency emissions are not difficult to detect. You put the things in a Faraday cage, you arrange it so that you have an antenna picking up the stuff coming out of the flies. And, you know, if your Faraday cage is good, and nothing goes in, and you still get a signal, then you've measured RF emissions, okay? Well, you have to make sure they're not thermal, they're not whatever, you have to do a few controls. But the bottom line is, uh, it's actually quite a simple experiment to do, and I think that uh, the discovery of spin polarization suddenly made it uh, 
absolutely mandatory to ask that question. And you know, because I was privy to Nauman's results, uh, uh, when was that? I think uh, eight years ago, I became aware of his work. I immediately thought, oh, this is great. Maybe we can measure that coming out of the brain. In fact, we did. Wow. So, so you see now, all these are little points, right? They're not really connected in a, in a grid, right? So we have spin changes in anesthesia over there. We have spin-related radio frequency emissions linked to brain function over here, and in between the Gobi Desert. Yeah, that, that's what makes it a fertile field for for theorists and and experimentalists to to work together and, and learn new things. Yes, and and you know, people. People always deplore um, fashions and, and uh, you know, the fact that people get very excited, that um, laymen women get very excited about that. But if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't get any funding. Um, because it takes an unreasonable amount of faith in reality distortion field to put money in quantum biology right now. And I'm so glad some people uh, are. In fact, the people who pay for me, uh, are, is a, it's a pharmaceutical company based in California. Wow, Who's doing great. some basic research on quantum biology. And it's absolutely extraordinary that, you know, a, a company, is, they're called Ionis, uh, they make uh, antisense RNA drugs. And it's amazing that a company that normally you would think, well, you know, they, come on, this isn't going to help their shareholders, you know, uh, you know, what could possibly come out? No, they want to be three steps ahead. So just getting back to the, the idea of the spin polarization going through when electron currents move through helical proteins is this linking uh dna into uh the processing that's a very very good question um of course dna is helical and and people have measured spin polarization uh of electrons flowing through dna and the answer is yes they polarize the the, the big question remains do any electron currents flow through dna in real life mm -hmm. um, i don't know um, I suspect not, but I could be wrong. But there, there are other potentially there are other chiral proteins in in the cell. Everything, everything is chiral. A, a sugar molecule is chiral. Every amino acid is chiral. So, uh, you know, the all of biology has handedness. Um, so, so this is one of the the great mysteries of biology, right? We we know that our DNA my, molecules have a handedness to them. They're the right handed. Helical versus left-handed helical. That's right. Uh, and so DNA is one, RNA is the opposite, and the proteins all come out with this this same kind of spiral uh, symmetry to them, which then leads to potentially spin polarization that may be key to uh, consciousness, which, which you know is is mind-boggling that this mystery of of Racemization of, of of biological <laughs> DNA it now is maybe linked to consciousness. That's really cool. Yeah, I, as I, I say, it would be um, interesting even if wrong. Yes, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> so, getting back to the the philosophy behind this, I don't know if you if you're a you must be a philosopher if you're interested in this to a certain extent. Uh, you know, the, the hard problem of consciousness. Philosophers claim that, you know, robots and classical computers are just zombies. They can't be sentient. They can't have internal experiences. And some people will say that, yes, they can. It's just the information processing that does it. And as, as we discussed, many people will just mumble quantum mechanics or panpsychism or some other mystical jargon to explain the problem away. But I don't think... It, anyone has has really been able to explain how quantum mechanics or even if quantum mechanics or quantum theories of mind can solve the robot zombie problem uh, is was there any were there any insights at your conference uh, uh, on quantum mind is this something that people are concerned about or, or they're not really too worried about that at this point they're just working on trying to understand what's going on I think there's a tenuous connection between non-locality uh, in quantum phenomena on the one hand and a sort of a holographic behavior of the brain, okay? You, you know, from the 30s onwards, there was always this notion that there were two schools of thought, you know, one which is um, 
this part of the brain does this or stores that information, okay, uh, precisely in that location. And the other one is all of it is kind of diffuse. It's a bit, it's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So like a hologram, the hologram was for a long time, the metaphor uh, for a particular school of thought about the brain, uh, exemplified by a wonderful man called Carl Pribram, who died um, a few years ago, an extraordinary, um, brilliant uh, neuroscientist. And his view of the brain was the brain essentially stores information as holograms. I mean, you know, you're familiar with the fact that if you take a hologram and you cut it, you still have the whole field of view in, the, in each half with the less resolution, admittedly, but it's, it's all there, okay? Mm. So, um, and there, there's very good evidence um, experimentally that, that it's very hard that, for example, memories are stored everywhere and that kind of thing. So, going back to the quantum mechanical aspect, if you have um, entanglement between um, distant things, that has the flavor of a holographic representation. I don't know that anyone has worked it out in a more precise fashion or even that it's possible to work it out. But as a kind of gut feeling, yeah, that, that's how it feels. It's not stored in a neuron or a small assembly of neuron. It's, it's everywhere. And I think that Matthew Fisher um, is, um, uh, one of the things he's uh, proposing is that there's entanglement between distant um, nuclear spins um, uh, over distances comparable to the size of the brain. Wow. And, th and this also goes to one of the, the philosophical problems they call the binding problem. How can you have a, a unified um, existence or unified experience of, of consciousness with disparate sensing elements combining into a single unified thing? And this, this then basically... Um, requires field theories to be somehow connected to the mind and not just individual uh, molecules and sensors uh, disconnected disparately. I think that the the unification of the, the wave function or, you know, other people say electromagnetic fields, some people say wave functions, but some sort of um, smooth um, distributed system has got to be at the root of this, I think. So that, that, that's a very interesting, the, the, the entanglement between disparate spins and could be a, at the root of that. Yes, I mean, bear in mind that um, um, the brain is quite resilient. I mean, um, it, it's kind of interesting that if you, you can put the brain in a very high magnetic field, up to seven Tesla, and people have no idea it's there. So, um, and similarly, with transcranial magnetic stimulation, you can put in large pulses of EM uh, energy, big electric fields, uh, big magnetic fields, transiently, and you get remarkably little. I remember I spoke to the guy who discovered transcranial magnetic stimulation because I wanted him to help me stimulate the olfactory bulb. And he said, oh, I would be glad to do that. This is only a small problem. Very British type of engineer, by the way. He, he said to me, it's only going to be a small problem. It'll Rip your eyeballs out of your head. <laughs> so, so we gave up on that. But then he, 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 he told me that when he started with these very short, intense pulses, he was concerned, quite rightly, that um, there, there was a distinct possibility that it would do permanent damage, that it would erase the hard disk or something. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they got this machine and they were turning up the intensity and he was trying it on himself because, of course, you're not going to do that on some poor guy who signed a, a, a you know, a, 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 a whatever, a consent form, not knowing what the hell is going on. So he tried it on himself. And he said to this day, he was actually rather surprised about the fact that TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, gives you small movements in the motor area, small visual stimuli. In other words, little phosphines in the visual field in the occipital part, and practically nothing at the front. Hmm. Okay, so whatever is going on in there is pretty robust against massive electromagnetic perturbations. So anyone who has a field theory of how the brain works really should look at that stuff and consider uh, their options. Wow, this is uh, this has been 
great uh, discussing with you. It's such a such an amazing emerging field. It's great to be at the forefront of a field like this and 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 really. Uh, be able to help think about what's going on. So uh, I appreciate you coming on the show and, and discussing your work with me. It's been a pleasure. Uh, very enlightening. I, I'm looking forward to digging more into this. Maybe, maybe I should uh, see if I can get uh, Dr. Fisher on the show and, and explain his. Oh, you you would love it. He's 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 wonderfully uh, uh, insightful and articulate. So so thank you again for coming on. Uh, I'm going to send you a Rational View T-shirt for for coming on the show. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, very much appreciate it. <laughs> Before I sign off, we have one question that I, I ask all of my contributors. Um, what kind of science fiction are you interested in? Do you, do you have uh, a particular favorite uh, show or book or, or author? Or? You know, I loved um, Hyperion. Um, okay. Uh, I can't even remember who the author was. But I, I like science fiction that makes the abnormal feel completely normal. Um, you know, you sort of get used to uh, green uh, conical shaped creatures that walk around on the on the sharp end. And after 20 pages, you feel that you've lived with it all your life. Um, that That's what I like because it reminds me a little bit of science, you know, where you have concepts that are initially just completely preposterous. And after after a year or two, <laughs> you know, what else is new? <laughs> Excellent. Oh. So, that's I really I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Luca. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patreon.podbean.com slash The Rational View. Thanks for listening.